All right, so we're going to have a little bit of a conversation today about an interesting topic in the equine industry. And, and what is that topic today, Ms. Cobra? The topic out of an article is racing for disaster, breeding thoroughbreds for speed may harm their health. Okay, Ms. Coker. Interesting article, but let's talk about this a little bit. So we read articles like this all the time, and it's interesting. This this article is catchy published titles. in catchy title. This is in science, so it's a, a relatively reliable source. We'll talk about that a little bit later okay. on. Um, but the first thing we might ask is, well, who's the author of this particular article? That's right. It says it's Ann Gibbons. Ann Gibbons. So we went and looked up her bio. Here's her bio. We're going to go ahead and bring that up. You guys can take a look at that. She's a scientific journalist, mm -hmm. so she seems relatively reliable. And if she's writing for a, a periodical like Science, we'll give her the benefit of the doubt here a little bit. She probably knows a little bit about genetics. She understands these areas. And she writes a pretty good article here. Absolutely. But we do want to question, some of these articles are for entertainment value as well. Sure. So this sounds very ominous, the health of the thoroughbred industry. Well, that's how you draw the reader in, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. But we'd also like to critically assess the article and see what she says in here and possibly some counter articles to this. Good. So let's look at a couple points through the article. So one of the things that Ann Gibbons, the author of this article, brings up is a little bit of background about California Chrome. Do you know who California Chrome was or yeah. is? Yeah. He won the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness. And Absolutely. disappointingly, he Fell lost short the Belmont. Of Belmont. Mm. Absolutely. That seems to happen a lot. Yes. So what she stated was that he was common stock. Mm. He was um, from an unspectacular mare or the wrong side of the thoroughbred tracks, as you may. I've said that about me sometimes, oh, too. Oh, that's disappointing. It is disappointing. <laughs> um, well, you know. So basically what they're saying was California Chrome was a nothing thoroughbred. Hmm. And that was one of the questions that were raised in here. But Dr. Stenier, was he a common thoroughbred? Well, it would be pretty exciting if he was, wouldn't it? It would know? be absolutely I mean, exciting. Hey, we right out of my out. backyard. Right, exactly. Breed that thoroughbred. Right. Um, but if we actually look at his pedigree, and we've got some of it here, so I'm going to go ahead and throw it up on the screen here. Uh, we can go through and circle uh, some particularly good stock back there. Yeah. Uh, now that's He's not blue blood. Yeah, it's not to say that he is in the upper echelon of what we would say. Well, that's the you know the perfect sort of breeding lines for a thoroughbred. Um, but for the most part, thoroughbreds have a lot of similar horses in their background, mm -hmm. which might bring up this question of being inbred or not. Okay, yeah. so um, I need a better definition of what inbred is. Well, so do I. Uh, and in a second, we'll bring in Dr. Deckow, and maybe he can help us with some of those questions. But I asked Dr. Deckow to look through a few articles before we do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is a part of your question of looking for reliable sources. Absolutely. I would love to know a little bit more about a reliable source and have our students and our viewers understand what a reliable source is. Um, not to say that Ann Gibbon's article is not reliable reliable, but there are some questions we're going to pull out of here that we might want to better understand or ask sure. while reading this. So a reliable source, it's all relative, right? Yeah. And so again, we, we try our best to find a, a large number of different pieces of evidence that maybe support our particular stance or or opinion or the facts that we're looking for. Good source for that information tends to be scientifically refereed journals, uh -huh. which are journals in which a number of different individuals have read that article and have determined that yes, the information there is good uh, and it's valuable to us going forward and making decisions based on the information. Uh -huh. So two of the articles that we've got here, one talks about inbreeding uh, in the thoroughbred and it sort of states that perhaps the current inbreeding rates, and we'll talk about those a little bit are worrisome, but doesn't outright say that it's bad. That and a lot bit. of times you'll notice inbreeding used in text or writing is used as a negative thing. And then on the in the other article, it talks about the inheritance or the potential inheritance of aspects of performance or speed in the horse. And so that's an interesting article as well. In a nutshell, it comes down to the fact that while there appears to be some heritability of those particular traits, at this point, it's relatively limited, actually. And so that'll bring up a whole another question as to what are the limits of speed in this particular thing. But let's go talk to Dr. Deckow. All right, we are talking about this interesting topic and to help us out with some of the information that we have, brought in Dr. Chad Deckow. 
Uh, he is our uh, geneticist within the Department of Animal Science. Many of you that are students in this class will have him in class someday. But we have some basic questions here, and we thought that Dr. Deckow might be able to answer some of those okay, for us. Okay, I'll try. All right, great. One of the topics that comes up uh, in this conversation and some of the material that we're looking at is that thoroughbreds have somehow become inbred, that we have an inbred population. What does that mean to be inbred when we talk about our livestock species? Well, what it means is that there's basically just less genetic diversity okay. than there was at earlier times, and we've got more of our genes that are homozygous okay. than were in the past. Is that a bad thing? It can be a bad thing, or but keep in mind that when we do genetic selection, our goal is to concentrate the best genes as rapidly as we can. And so when we do that, we tend to get more homozygosity of the best genes. So on that side, it's good. The flip side is that we also know that there are some developmental genes that uh, if we get two copies of a defective gene, we end up with an embryo, lethal embryo condition, there is a bad downside to it as well, and that's why we want to try to avoid it to some degree and okay. to manage it. That helps a little bit. Is there... How do we decide whether we have too much inbreeding or not? What are some of the things that, for example, the thoroughbred industry should be looking for that would tell us, yes, we have too much inbreeding, or no, we're, we're pretty good right now? The old joke for, among animal breeders is that if it works, it's called line breeding. And if something bad happens, we call it inbreeding. But I think the, the main thing is that you have to look at current levels of inbreeding and associate it with a horse's performance for different traits. And if you see that, yeah, the inbred animals really do have more problems of some sort, then that kind of gives you an idea of what the current population can handle and if you've gone too far or not. So it's really, there's no, this is too much inbreeding. It's at what point does inbreeding start to impair the performance of the horse? You had a chance to look look at some of the, the articles we look at. One is, one talks about, kind of tries to put some numbers on inbreeding in the thoroughbred. And, and you voice some interest in sort of comparing that to what we see perhaps, and, and uh, an example comes up in the, in the dairy industry. How might you compare the two of those? Based on the numbers in those papers, we've had a lot higher rate of inbreeding in dairy cattle than we have in horses since 1960 because we have more intense genetic selection in dairy cattle for specific traits and a shorter generation interval. Since 1960, dairy cattle have accumulated more inbreeding than horses. But on the flip side, dairy cattle have a larger founder population than horses. So they started out with more variation. So I don't know that we can really, or at least I don't have a good sense of how much genetic diversity is there in the thoroughbred population versus relative to the dairy cattle population today. So it's hard to make a direct comparison, but I would say the rate of inbreeding in thoroughbreds is, is not high. Well, that's perfect. That, I think that helps a lot. One of the, the other papers, uh, and I'm going to read a quote from that paper, and I wonder if you might sort of tell us what you think about this. It says, however, the major advantage is that racing performance may be evaluated in both males and females, and repeated observations can be obtained on the same animal in a relatively short period. These factors, coupled with reasonable heritability of some measures of racing performance suggest that mass selection based on performance tests would be the selection procedure of choice to improve the racing performance of thoroughbred horses. What's being described there? They're describing a lot of things there. One of the things that they're describing is that, for example, in dairy cows, bulls don't give milk, which creates an additional complication. But in horses, both males and females can race. Right. So they have a little bit of an advantage there. The relatively short time period between races, you can get many observations on an animal mm -hmm. pretty quickly, which gives us a better sense of their genetic potential fairly quickly. So those are advantages yep. horses may have compared to some other species. And then in addition to that, there are some measures of racing performance that have reasonable heritability. So what the author is suggesting is that we can measure, we can determine who the best racing animals are early on in their life and then use those animals to become our breeding stock. So the fastest mares, we're going to mate with the fastest stallions. Okay. Ultimately, we're What's our best bet? That's kind of what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is that the generation interval in horses is very long, 10 years on average, when you yep. decide, kind of wait until a stallion has completed his career, say, he was a great horse, I want to get as many foals out of him as I can now. From my perspective as a dairy cattle breeder, you would make that decision early on and say, we think this is a good stallion. Yep. 
we're going to use him now. Maybe we don't use too much of one stallion. We use a little bit of that stallion here. And then if he turns out to have been a dud, well, we didn't have too many right. lousy offspring from him. But to me, the, the generation interval is the big limiting factor. All right. Any other thoughts you have on this before we go ahead and leave and head back? No, it's just, it's really interesting. Uh-huh. Um, to compare what's happened in the horse industry to the dairy cattle industry. All right. Well, Dr. Deckow, thank you very much for coming in and joining us today. No problem. And uh, maybe we'll have you back again sometime. All right. All right. Thank great. You. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and show a picture here. Here we're talking about the winning race times huh? for thoroughbreds in the Triple Crown Series. So the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont. And, the Belmont. Okay. Okay. and so what's one of the things that stands out to you in this particular graph? That the times haven't changed a whole lot. We've been pretty stagnant with racing times. You can see there's a little bit of fluctuation when there might be a big winner. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming you can see secretariats. Yeah. If you look at all the years of racing, we really haven't improved on times. Right. And so those racing times really haven't improved since about the 1960s. And so there are lots of questions as to why that hasn't happened, why there hasn't been an improvement in that. And we'll talk about some of that as we go through. And all right. So as we talk about all of this, you know, it's always interesting to look at what the quote unquote experts think, right? Yep. Uh, and so I've got a quote here from Dr. David Kronfeld uh, from an article in The Blood Horse. Wait, and who is Dr. David Kronfeld? So Dr. David Kronfeld happened to be my PhD advisor at Virginia Tech, okay. um, but was also somebody that was very much involved in the horse industry. So if I read this quote, he says, this is out of his article called Speed Limit, which was published in The Blood Horse. This dismal prospect of an increasingly fragile racing thoroughbred is a challenge to owners and breeders. They are left to grapple with the ethical issues, the economic realities, and the inevitable conundrum that environmental management of the side effects of breeding for speed aims to help the individual while weakening the breed. It's very interesting. It sounds like it's a rock and hard place. It does. And, and that's exactly what he talks about in the article because he says that, look, when we select a thoroughbred to run very fast, we might also be selecting for some traits that are health problems that we see. Examples of those might be EIPH, which is exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage or mm -hmm. bleeding, maybe gastric ulcers, problems like that. So he focused on his, his statement here basically says breeding for speed comes along with or these diseases come along with breeding for speed. So imagine how hard it is to breed for an animal that doesn't have those things but is a speedy animal or do they get slower? Exactly. Uh, and so I think that that's something, that's, it's an ongoing question to say the truth today. It's something that we still have to grapple with as an industry to how to do that. It also represents some opportunities that we have for the environmental management aspect of things okay. to think about how are we feeding these animals? How are we managing them? How are we growing them? Right. What are the things that we can do? We know what those particular diseases or conditions are that are associated with speed. What can we do to best manage those? Okay. Um, and we have to be careful when we say that because we should always also be thinking about the genetic side of things of not ignoring them but thinking about okay how can we manage them in the horses that we have today while at the same time trying to improve the genetics so we see less of those problems occurring in the long term. Okay so earlier we mm -hmm. looked at a great graph I think is a, a wonderful graph of the times for thoroughbreds sure. in the three largest, the jewels of the Triple Crown, right. um, and how they have not improved mm -hmm. over that time, except for the wonderful anomaly secretariat that I have to keep bringing up. Sure. So does that mean we can't improve on speed? What about dog racing? What about quarter horse racing? Have they improved? And those are just the questions that would be generated from this article. Sure. Actually, this has been looked at in a relatively limited sense. And so here's another article that's looked at this. And so this, this particular article looks at limits and that question of the limit of speed in horses, dogs, and, and humans, actually. And humans is a great, great point, because what about racing, just the humans racing, uh, or just swimming? They're constantly breaking world records, U.S. records. Why mm -hmm. can't we get to that point where we're improving? So I think that what the data seems to indicate is that we have actually reached the limit of speed in our current stock of whether it be thoroughbreds or greyhounds. And we've bred them relatively intensively, as we've been talking about through yeah. this, for that particular performance characteristics. So it, it appears that from a physiologic standpoint, we may have reached that limit of speed. I'm going to go ahead and, and read a quote out of that same paper okay. that I think is quite interesting in regard to where we might go or what the possibilities might be. Now, this is a, a sort of out of reality because we can't, the thoroughbred industry right now is, is a, a closed registry. Yeah, um, but absolutely. what might we do? In a larger sense, however, the equine data presented here are preliminary at best. 
It may well be possible that different criteria for selective breeding of horses could produce a faster animal. Thoroughbreds have been recognized as a separate breed since the 1700s, and regulation of the breed has constrained its gene pool. Thoroughbreds are less genetically diverse than other breeds of horses. The breed is effectively a closed lineage descended from as few as 12 to 29 individuals, and 95% of the paternal lineages in present-day thoroughbreds can be traced to a single stallion, the Darley Arabian. Selective breeding starting with different equine stock could perhaps yield faster horses. In this sense, then, the results presented here do not necessarily address the question of the maximum speed for the species Equus cabalis. Okay, so we've spent a very <laughs> short amount of time talking about a very complex topic, and there's no way that we can cover this topic appropriately in the amount of time that we have. Time but flies when you're having fun. It does fly when you're having fun, <laughs> and I really enjoy this. There are a lot of questions that remain in regard to this particular topic, and I will tell you that we actually spent a lot of time outside of producing this 10 to 15 minute vlog where we pulled together a lot of different data sources and tried to incorporate some good information for you all. Uh, having said that, this is a topic that you could spend days and days talking about, and people do. Some of the questions that remain, I think, are one, are we breeding for speed or durability uh, in the thoroughbred? I don't know that there's a clear answer to that question. It's one that certainly many people are interested in looking at, but I'm not sure that there's a clear answer to that. Another question is, are thoroughbreds inbred? And if they are, is that a bad thing or a good thing? I'm mean, just another question. Have thoroughbreds reached their limit of speed. Can we, no matter how much we breed, maybe they are just physiologically not capable of running any faster. Have we reached that limit? Is there any, is there enough variance in the breed that would allow us to do that or do we have to go by some other techniques? Right. And another question we didn't answer um, and is a very good one. Are we racing for disaster? The title was catchy, uh, certainly caught our eye, mm -hmm. um, but is it disastrous? Is it that the a downfall of the thoroughbred industry, the racing and the breeding? I don't think so, but but certainly a question that we haven't answered. So these are all things to think about, and I think it highlights that from a relatively simple, straightforward article, we can raise a lot of questions, and there are a lot of things for the horse industry to be talking about. And this doesn't just involve just the thoroughbred industry. It really means the horse industry as a whole and thinking about what we're doing with each of our breeds that's beneficial or detrimental and, and what the future holds as we go forward. So we want to thank right. you guys for joining us very for, much our, for sticking our with us. very first vlog. <laughs> It'll be interesting to look back on this one as the years go forward. And uh, cringe, probably. Right. It's going to be, exactly. be cringe-worthy. Right. Exactly. And see where things go. But this was the first one. Uh, so we'll see how it all goes. And I hope this has left you with a lot of questions and makes you go out and do a little bit of research on your own.